Well, we are live with our Thursday, The Lie of the Land, with Kevin Lings, Chief, Chief Economist at Stanlib. Kevin, talk to me about Evergrande, 23rd of October. Why is this so important in the life of the troubled real estate giants? So remember Evergrande, a uh, massive property developer in China, hugely indebted. Uh, the, at this stage, from what we know, the most indebted property developer in China. They have missed, uh, I think, three already. They've missed three coupon payments on dollar bonds that they need to pay. The total of that, if you add them all together, is approaching $280 million. So they've missed all three of those. And then what they did... Uh, in order to rescue the business, they entered into discussions with a property developer in Hong Kong, Hong Kong-based property developer, and they uh, tried to set up a transaction where the Hong Kong company would buy 50.1% of Evergrande, and then I presume inject a whole lot of cash and try and sort out the difficulty. So the market was kind of waiting for news on that, and we got that news today, which those talks have failed. And that deal, from what we understand, is now not going ahead. So obviously they couldn't reach an agreement. Now the problem is that once you once you don't make your coupon payment, they give you a grace period of 30 days. So it's not as if you are immediately in default. You get a grace period of 30 days in which to make good on that coupon payment. And the first coupon payment they missed was the 23rd of September. So fast forward 30 days, and we're now pretty much uh, 23rd of October, more or less, 22nd, 23rd of October. And that's on the weekend, which means that if Evergrande can't make that coupon payment, they are then technically in default. And then that will trigger a whole lot of other uh, other events. So clearly Evergrande this is, this has... huge. Been... I mean, is this tantamount to the end of the world in the financial market space? Are we going to see this ricocheting through the entire world? So, so potentially, yes. Because obviously, the authorities have looked at this, and the feedback coming from the authorities in China seems to be that they feel the system can cope with an Evergrande default. So I'm assuming they've looked at it and they've evaluated. They obviously don't More want like to... An orderly, an orderly default. They obviously feel that it can be managed. They don't want to bail out Evergrande for, I think, obvious reasons because it sends exactly the wrong message. At the time, they're trying to introduce this common prosperity agenda. So that would be inconsistent. So they feel, obviously, that the system can cope with it. They have been injecting, the central bank has been injecting additional liquidity into the system when the Evergrande story broke. And they obviously would be willing to inject additional liquidity. But clearly with these things, you can't quite uh, always determine <laughs> what the effect will be. And you only really know it when it happens and when the linkages start to become uh, more. Uh, and, and those linkages, I mean, Kevin, the numbers that are being bandied about, 171 banks in the, the local space, so in China itself, 121 additional banks. This is an ecosystem that is going to be very difficult for the Chinese government to manage through the default. So potentially, yes. I mean, it's a huge amount of debt, 300 billion um, US dollars. And obviously, it you know, if you try to sort it out, it would take many months to unravel uh, the financial complications. But the knock-on effect into markets could be quite substantial. The argument, the argument being put forward, and I don't know if it's a valid argument, is that yes, there are a lot of banks involved, there are a lot of institutions involved, but each one has a fairly small amount of exposure relative to their total exposure. So yes, you're going to find a lot of people incurring pain, but each pain point is not enough to then wreck that particular financial institution. That's the argument. I don't know do if that's buy, Do you valid. buy the argument? Do you buy the argument? I would, be, I would be very nervous about it because my experience with this is that you never really fully understand where all the debt lies and, and where all the linkages are. And we saw that with the global financial market crisis. And we know the world economy on the financial system is very integrated. And you can be surprised by some of these linkages and therefore some of the fallout. Um, 
but it feels to me as that that's where we're heading. Clearly, Evergrande tried to get um, something sorted out themselves, and it appears that that's not going to work. It seems like there's too little time now before the weekend to come up with something else. It doesn't feel like the Chinese government, on the face of it, is about to step in and provide some sort of emergency financing. It's possible they do that. So are markets, we seeing markets, markets are nervous. Are we seeing the market reacting? Are we seeing pullbacks? Are we seeing yeah. uh, a risk so we're starting scenario to, coming in? Yeah, so we're starting to see that. Uh, obviously, our market's under a bit of pressure. Currency starting to come under pressure. Um, and I think that it takes, well, I've, it's quite interesting this, but news flow, I find, um, works very easily and quickly out of Europe and out of the United States, but not quite as rapidly out of Asia. It actually takes a while for that to disseminate. So I suspect that it, the news flow will pick up and, and um, we'll digest this more fully. But yes, it's already starting to impact markets. Um, and I guess you just don't... Again. You don't know to what extent it will impact markets, but I mean, if you think about it, uh, markets, uh, the fear factor is still, you know, at a crescendo levels, given the global pandemic, we are very sensitive as a global ecosystem. So you would very expect much so. panic to, to hit um, across the board. Yeah, so, so, the, so that risk of panic, which we've been trying to highlight is um, is very real because there are a number of potential policy errors that can be made here that Evergrande could well be, you don't know, a policy error by by the Chinese government where on reflection you would say, oh, they should have helped them, they should have should have viewed it as too big to fail. Um, and, and we know that there are other potential type events uh, elsewhere in the world and we know that uh, for example, if global inflation becomes a problem and they move interest rates up, we could find, again, some sort of panic in financial markets about where interest rates are going. So it feels to me that we're in an environment where markets are especially sensitive because you can't be sure about where this is all heading. So, yeah, I think it's a, it's a high-risk event. The other thing which is probably, probably more of a concern is that what is the message that it's sending with regards to potential support for many other businesses in China that I would argue are also highly indebted and are also unable to assist themselves? And, and that's going to that's gonna start to feed back into people's understanding of will the Chinese government stand behind a lot of businesses or a lot of state-owned enterprises where people thought, no, the Chinese government will bail them out. There's not a problem. We can see they're highly indebted, but China will step in. Maybe not so much. And I think that has that implication. Because and then on they're, top setting of it, a precedent. they're setting a precedent now with, with yes. Evergrande. And uh, they're going to be in a very, I mean, they've either got to have very, very deep pockets uh, or they're going to be in a very difficult situation when they start picking and choosing who they're going to back and who they won't back. I mean, what's happened to Fantasia? So they so they it's they also heading in exactly the same direction and and from what I understand and you mentioned it previously there are other developers that are also highly indebted and would also be moving into exactly the same space where they are unable to service coupon payments and unable to to service debt um, and there's no doubt if you look we're just talking about missed coupon payments if you look at Evergrande's bonds the actual bonds that are maturing next year. They are just phenomenal in size. We're talking billions of, of dollars. Um, so there's no chance of them being able to make those sorts of payments given the environment. And then the, and then the other aspect, which, which I think is, is very real in China, is this is undermining the entire property sector. Um, it's, it's causing a lack, lack of confidence in the purchase of property, in property owners, in property prices, uh, in prop, other property developers being able to, to get finance. This has far wide implications for how China is going to grow. So maybe, just maybe, Evergrande can be absorbed by the system. I don't know. But I don't think that's where the implications end. I think it's far more complex than that. So you would anticipate, well, I mean, where are we now? We're Thursday. 
Friday, we're likely to see some action. And as you say, then it's the weekend. So it might be a case of hold on to your hat. This is going to be a very volatile ride. I want to, you spoke about inflation. And um, as we know, inflation is, again, you know, a, a panic term out there at the moment. How high is it going to go? Has the Federal Reserve lost control of the inflationary environment? But the underpin of how important inflation is when it comes to central banks actually making decisions on interest rates. I think I, I want you to unpack that linkage for me. So to me, it's more critical than ever, and it's probably the most critical I've seen it right now. And I, and I don't think it's overstating the issue. Let me, let me just quickly explain what the problem is. So we know everywhere in the world that inflation is moving up. It's not just the US, not just South Africa. Uh, when you look at developed countries, emerging market countries, across the board, inflation has become a problem, both at the producer level and consumer level. And we know that commodity prices are elevated, and we know that there are significant supply disruptions everywhere in the world. And we know that central banks on the whole keep saying um, this is transitory, and that once the supply disruptions are restored, inflation numbers will come down. There are a couple of significant issues here. The one is this is broadening out to a very wide range of sectors. So this isn't just microchips. This isn't just the motor industry. This is much broader than that. Almost every sector being affected around the world because of these supply disruptions. And the second thing is that this isn't something that feels like it's going away anytime soon. When you look at individual sectors, the companies reporting saying this could take months, this could take more than a year to try and resolve these supply disruptions. So in the meantime, this inflationary pressure is going to build up. There are shortages of goods already. That doesn't mean that demand's going away. Demand remains quite strong. And as long as demand is fairly strong and there aren't the available goods, people will bid up the price in order to get the goods, especially as you get closer to the Christmas period. So to give you a, a little example, I follow, um, actually, just as an interesting thing, the port of Los Angeles, the biggest, it's the biggest container port in the world. They do a press conference once a month, and it's actually an interesting press conference because it gives you a real feel about what's happening to the dynamics of the U.S. economy because that's goods coming in mostly from China and being passed on to the U.S. consumer. And when you look at, uh, and then you've got the port of Long Beach, which is right next door to uh, the Los Angeles ports, and that's the second biggest container port in the U.S. So you've got the two biggest container ports in the U.S., right next to each other in the in, in the Los Angeles Bay. And yesterday, yesterday, day before yesterday, there were 100 ships waiting in the bay to offload goods. That excludes the ships that are in the harbor actually being offloaded. Now, if you go back to before COVID, at the same time of the year, there would have been 20 ships waiting to offload. So, so what, what's happening here? There's a huge amount of orders being placed. These orders are trying to be fulfilled. That stuff's being put on ships. Ships are being delayed, but ultimately they get to the port. When they get to the port in Los Angeles, they just aren't the trucks. They, they aren't the railway system. There isn't the people to offload it at that pace. Now, that sounds bizarre, but that's what you've got to. So you've got these significant supply disruptions. As you can't hire staff that you need, as people are going off sick because of COVID, as areas of activity get closed down because you find that you're getting COVID infections and you have to shut down that system and that's happening around the world and what this is doing is systematically pushing prices up everywhere in the world now if this is sustained for a period of time which it feels like it you're going to start to have inflation become more embedded at a much higher level so now the the central bank has a dilemma do they respond to this and start to move interest rates up and if they do that they're going to catch markets unaware markets have been thinking we've got tons of time before interest rates go up the so-called liftoff in the U.S. is only 2023. So if, if the Federal Reserve starts to panic and think, oh, I better push interest rates up, inflation's a problem, that is going to unsettle markets. And I Because the market's the, not expecting it. It's going to take the market completely by, um, by surprise. And that, That's as right. you are, are rightly saying, is going to be panic. That's right. Because, because the messaging from the Federal Reserve has been, this is transitory. And if you look at the dot plot, from the U.S. Federal Reserve, it's kind of saying maybe interest rates go up at the end of next year, but possibly only 2023. That's a long way off for, for financial markets. What happens if that all rushes at you a lot quicker and a lot more aggressively? In other words, you've got to move interest rates up more significantly. 
where are you going to hide under those circumstances? You don't want to be in bonds because inflation's moving up, interest rates are moving up. It's going to feel like bonds are the wrong place to be. But equally, you don't want to be in equities because interest rates are moving up. That's going to under. Are you undermine. telling me there's no place to hide, Kevin? Is that the reality here? That's the that's the the. The big negative scenario where where are you going to hide other than Bitcoin? Where are you going to hide? Because you, your traditional assets are not going to be offering you value. They've all been built up value based on what? Massive ongoing liquidity, sustained low interest rates, sustained low inflation. If you change those three things, you take the liquidity out the system, you get sustained high inflation, sustained high interest rates. The premise on which you've been buying bonds and equities dissipates. In which case you're going to find that valuations are too expensive. So that's the real negative, right? That's if inflation doesn't is not transitory and it's more persistent. And I must say, when you delve into this topic, there's lots of evidence it's becoming more persistent. Now, flip it on the other side. What happens if the central banks are right? And this is fully transitory, and that in a couple of months' time, a couple of weeks' time, the supply inflation disruption starts to get inflation now moves down. You've Think about the base effects. You know, you had uh, used car prices in the U.S. Uh, 40 percent year on year. That's a massive base. It's not going to be sustained. So now you've got inflation moving down very sharply, and it is truly transitory. Then the central bank's going to be well. We don't have to hike interest rates. Inflation's coming down, and it's going to be back to the races. In other words, back into bonds because they've sold off a little bit. Back into equities because. Now, interest rates aren't going up for a considerable period of time, and there isn't an inflation problem, in which case you're going to want to own a hell of a lot of risky assets. And right now, you're sitting with those two dilemmas. And, and when you listen to the commentators out there and the uh, analysts, etc., I promise you there's equal weight being placed on both of those arguments. And but, but what is your, so what is your fundamental bet here? I mean, and I suppose it is a bet. Because who knows how this is going to pan out. But I mean, yours is an educated bet. So let me rephrase that. Where where would you be placing so, your So I'm, bet I'm, erring, I'm erring on the side that this is more persistent, that the supply disruptions are more extensive than what you imagine, that it's causing price effects are much across a bigger range of goods than you currently expect, and that it's not going away anytime soon. And the reason I don't think it's going away anytime soon is because outside of, of Europe and the U.S. and the U.K., when you look at a whole range of smaller countries, Asian countries, they're struggling with COVID. They're struggling with vaccine rollout. They're not able to get their systems up and going. And, and there are still going to be ongoing disruptions. You've got this perpetual risk of another variant coming about that can disrupt the whole system again. I would just be cautious that this feels more persistent then it's going away anytime soon. And if we fair, right, if we if we analyze this, based on the initial arguments that were put forward around US uh, global inflation, it should really have been transitory. When it started to materialize, people said three months, maybe at the outset six months, it should already show signs of dissipating. And right but it's now not. it's showing signs, no, it's showing signs of, of accelerating. Being it's showing signs of accelerating. High. And we haven't even started so, to factor in the, the oil price where it is. That's only just recent. It hasn't started. Think about South Africa. We're still facing another one rand a litre increase in the petrol price. We, we, so this thing is still very real. And I'm just and, saying and and be cautious. I mean, the oil price, we've discussed this previously, but the oil price in your book is going to stay high for a considerable period of time. I mean, this is a new base case for, for oil, isn't it? So, so my mind, yes, because I just don't see people getting into oil development the way they have previously. And, and I think what gets missed is that supplies get, get, get consumed on a regular basis in various areas. And then you've got to change the drilling and you've got to move into another area and you've got to explore that. And if you're not investing CapEx and new fields and sinking new uh, drilling rigs, etc., you just don't sustain the same level of output. But the incentive there to invest isn't, hasn't been good because you know the alternative energy thing is coming and you don't want to be the guy investing for the next 10 years as the world goes to electricity, electric cars. So, so I think the oil price stays higher than what it's been for a considerable period of time. But it's not just that. It's, you know, China's got this big dilemma where they're trying to fight carbon emissions. They, they can't produce electricity at the pace they want to. 
The cost of coal has rocketed in China. They're having to slow down the production of aluminium, cement, and steel. And that in itself is causing supply disruptions. So, no, it doesn't feel like this is going to sort itself out anytime soon, actually. So and is that all in the well, price? So, so sorry. Is it all in, exactly. Is it all in the price? I mean, that's the and big I'm question. I'm saying no. I'm saying no, it's not in the price because the price has been on the basis of this is transitory and that um, inflation is going to be coming down in the next couple of weeks, couple of months into early next year and that interest rates don't have to go up much. And I think that there's massive risk around that, which I'd be cautious about. Well, Kevin, I must say, you know, I, I do hope you are not right, but I hear the caution and I hear the concern and we're going to know pretty soon how this starts unfolding in the market. So this is something we're going to be focusing on specifically in this weekly show. Now, I think so, translate yeah. that into the impact for the festive season retail sales in South Africa. And, and earlier today, I was chatting to Mia Milan, editor-in-chief of Becky Sisa, and, you know, she's become the, the de facto um, guru on all COVID-related facts in terms of vaccines and uh, the rate of transmission, etc. It looks like the, the second wave is now sort of pretty much going to be the, the second half of December. And you, you can imagine wave, how that's going to impact the retail cycle. I don't know what you're hearing. I mean, this, this must be something that's factoring into your models. Yes. Okay, so from my perspective, um, obviously, the, la the third wave, which we've got past, um, that's well under control. The, the data from all our sources say that the numbers are low, hospital numbers are fine, death numbers are, are actually coming down. It's not as if the hospital system seems under pressure. So I would say we're kind of in a good space right now. The vaccine rollout um, has been okay. I think it could be you would want it to be better, but I think it's okay. But it's very clear that we should be accelerating that now in this phase in order to try and avoid a fourth wave of it. If you do the maths, yes, December, you've got a fourth wave. And and obviously, that, <laughs> that would occur at exactly the wrong time, right? Of because course. think about the, the travel implications, the well, hotel booking implications. Industry. And then you're going to have this worry, and it's a legitimate worry, that let's say a whole lot of people are down at, uh, at the coast in various holiday places, and now you've got this fourth wave which is built up. People are becoming infected. They come back to Johannesburg, Pretoria in early, uh, late December, early January. Now you've got the, 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 the wave, the fourth wave spreading much more vigorously within the whole of South Africa. And, and then effectively you into a shutdown a more severe shutdown as we go into 2022 and 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 clearly the economy would would struggle so that's the prognosis that we're looking at uh, if at the same time you've got an additional variant which materializes that would then be obviously hugely difficult i guess what you've got to hope hmm, is that i the hope you're going to give me some good news because i don't know what i'm going to do after this conversation i mean literally yeah. I am, no, Kevin, I'm serious. I mean, I feel very, very down at the moment. So is there any, and I'm meaning this, and I mean, I know I've got a smile on my face, but is there any positivity out there or is there something that you can make so, me feel so better the, about? So the, I guess the positive thing is that, for, is that you know, we, we're getting towards the end of October and the numbers still look good. So you cannot look at the data and say that the fourth wave has started. That's not true. There's no... You're just basing it on mathematical models and projections, and that's fair, but it hasn't started. The second is that the vaccines um, do make any, do have an effect, especially in the early part of getting the vaccine, a month after getting the vaccine, they're highly effective. So, so we could get a little bit uh, lucky in terms of we happen to have, you know, by then, let's say 25, 30 million people uh, with vaccines, and that's has a meaningful impact. And we could also get lucky where there's no additional variant to deal with and that, um, again, the system is able to cope with the Delta variant more effectively and that the fourth wave is there, but it's nowhere near where it was in the, in the second and third wave. And it doesn't really necessitate from a hospital point of view a significant uh, level of lockdown, in which case we would then end up in, in a quite a favorable position 
because it means that we've kind of escaped the fourth wave and we continue on with vaccinations. But it really just do, does depend on how, um, how vigilant people are, how responsible they are. Uh, I think where South Africa is, is a bit different is the weather is going to be on our sides going into this phase. And that is very helpful. And we know that weather plays a significant role here. The second thing is that the mask and the sanitization has an effect and that we are fairly, by global standards, fairly disciplined in adhering to masking and having uh, sanitation. So that may also have an effect. And I think also the fact that uh, we, we, we can, during the summer months, be fairly spread out. In other words, not everybody is sitting on top of each other. So hopefully there are enough mitigating factors that this doesn't overwhelm. But it's clearly something we've got to be vigilant about. In terms of where we are... Um, you know, the economy is trying to recover. That's clear. The July unrest that definitely knocked us and, and we've had a bad third quarter. We, we, we bounced back a bit from the unrest and the looting, but we're not fully back from that. So there and is a got, legacy we just, problem. And we've got the, the, the local government elections around the corner. So, so I describe South Africa in, unfortunately, a, a treading water or a holding pattern. So think about what we're waiting for. We're waiting to see if there's a fourth wave. We're waiting to see whether the Reserve Bank starts to hike interest rates on the 18th of November, which is entirely feasible. We're waiting to see what the local government election brings. We're waiting to see if we can get progress in terms of load shedding uh, and the maintenance thing into the end of the year and get some private sector uh, projects going. And then we're waiting for Spectrum and we're waiting for the medium term uh, budget policy statement and what tax revenue. So there's a lot of things that we kind of in a holding pattern waiting to see. And we quite frankly are hoping that some of these give us a little bit of a positive momentum into, into next year and get the economy going. Right now, the economy is treading water. It's not a disaster. It's not uh, collapsing. None of that. We've got some positive growth, but it's clearly not accelerating. So you either then take a positive view and say some of these things are going to start to materialize more fully. And if we go into next year, we pass the fourth wave vaccine rollout is more uh, evident. And we started to see some investment in the energy projects and then it'll start to feel better. Or we fail on all of these issues. The Reserve Bank hikes interest rates. It's clear that government is not being disciplined. COVID is now another problem. We've got a massive fourth wave. So again, we've kind of got this. It gets nicely better. Or oh, actually, it looks terrible. Same as we've been talking about what uh, global interest rates can do. So it feels as if the next couple of months are critical to how we're going to experience 2022. We just got to hope that it's better than 2020 and 2021. But anyway, I, I, you know what I'm going to take from this? I'm treading water until our next engagement in a week's time. I'm going to be exhausted by the time we get to this desk. But at least I know I'm not going to drown. I'm treading water and I'm hoping that you're going to be able to throw me some elements, all right, in terms of but, but, uh, just but a, keeping me afloat. But, Bonwin, I think the key issue here is, is not to hide from the issues, be aware of what these issues are, follow them as they transpire, understand are they, are they objectively getting better or worse, and then evaluate it right now. It just so happens that there are a range of domestic and international risks that financial markets are facing after a reasonable phase and that we can't, don't, don't simply ignore them. Uh, have a look at how those risks are panning out. Kevin, certainly a rational voice in a sea of uncertainty. Kevin Lings is the chief economist at Standler. Great having you on Live the Land. Same time next week, uh, 4.30, you can join us. And as I said, I'm treading water. You're going to throw me, hopefully, some uh, lifeboat elements there. Thank you very much, Kevin Lings. Thanks, Bruno.